ago really marked kind of the modern era of missions here at 9th and O. It was in 2004 uh, that we launched the, the, the first, as, 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 as long as I've been here, it was the very first uh, 9th and O missions team. Uh, we started taking trips. Uh, back then we had, uh, on Sunday nights, we do these mission reports about every quarter on, on Sunday nights. And, and you know, God uh, was really growing that ministry. And today, as we think about missions, and as we're reflecting on missions, there's really two, um, we we, we have the task today of holding two emotions in tension with one another. One of them is is we are incredibly thankful, right, for what the Lord has done, what the Lord continues uh, to do. You see a few things up here on the screen of of just things that have happened over these last 20, uh, 20 years. You know, we have 140 plus mission trips that have, that have been sent out from this church. Uh, we've established meaningful, long-term relationships with a, a number of wonderful organizations. Uh, today, we're, we're really highlighting our partnership in Ecuador. Uh, hopefully, you've had a cupcake already. Uh, if, if you need to take two, nobody's going to notice. Uh, but we've got cupcakes celebrating just 20 years of, of ministry in Ecuador and all that God has, has done there. Uh, we've commissioned many members onto the mission field uh, since we really began doing the, the Great Commission offering, uh, which our goal uh, this year is 115000 That's the largest uh, we've ever had. We're doing it during a building campaign. Jeff Eliff, you're welcome. Uh, but we are pushing forward with missions giving, and we're excited about uh, we're excited about that goal. But since we launched the, the Great Commission offering in 2010, uh, 3.3 million dollars has been given. Uh, through the Great Commission offering and the cooperative program. So that's just a, just a fantastic number. And, and I think what I'm most excited about is that almost every Sunday at this point, in room 122, through this wall here, uh, we've got people gathering to pray for missions. So we're incredibly thankful for what God has done and where he, he has brought us to this point. But at the same time, we, we have this other emotion of just urgency. You know, the job is not done. And in one of the cards that you have there, there's a statistic from the IMB that says six out of 10 people in the world still today do not have meaningful access to the gospel. One of the cards uh, that that you have here is the the title is Lostness Among Our Missionaries. And, And what we did is we contacted our missionaries and we said, you know, what does lostness look like where you're doing ministry? And they wrote back and they said, this is exactly what lostness looks like and this is how you can pray for us. So, so lostness is still all around us. And you know, a day is coming when unfortunately, you know, well, actually it will be fortunate, but there won't need, you won't need a missions pastor because the day is coming that missions will no longer need to exist. Evangelism will no longer exist because Jesus will return. But until that day, we need to have, feel a sense of urgency to go and to share the gospel. So with this in mind, our theme for today is Lost Cause. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 7. And in this passage, uh, Luke is highlighting, uh, through Jesus' parables, God's love for lost people. This morning, we're specifically going to look at the first of these parables. There's three parables about lostness. But we're going to look at the parable of the lost sheep. And our plan this morning is to look at these seven verses, uh, gather whatever uh, instruction and insights the Lord would have for us. And then let's see what this means for us today as we think about missions in 2024. You know, whenever you you come to the Word of God, when you open it, and this is true for for the, the parable of the lost sheep or whatever it might be, you need to understand the context. Right? Context is king. So when, when you're studying a, a verse, it needs to be seen in the context of surrounding verses. And when you're looking at a group of verses, you need to see it in the context of the chapter. And when you're looking at a chapter of Scripture, you need to see it in the context of the theme of the overall book. And when you're looking at the theme of the overall book, you need to see it in the context of the entire canon of scriptural, Scripture. And what happens is when we do this, when we kind of grapple with, with what's happened before, what's going to happen next, then we're able to properly understand what the biblical authors want to teach us through this text. And that's what we want to do this morning. Because we don't want to fall into the pitfall of, uh, of trying to get the text to say just what we want it. You know, I'd love for the text to say, you got to give to the GCO. you got to go on a mission trip. Jesus wants you. You know, I'd love to say those exact things. But we really need to be faithful to the Scripture. You know, in, in the Greek text, um, there actually are no chapter breaks, if you didn't know that. And so when we look at chapter 15, we really need to look back into chapter 14. And in chapter 14, Jesus has just finished telling the people that are listening, if you want to follow me, the cost of discipleship is great. It is great. In fact, if you want to follow me, 
You're going to have to love God over your own family. If you want to follow me, it comes with great sacrifice. You may have to sacrifice possessions or even your own life. If you want to follow me, you've got to be salty. You have to be set apart because if you're no longer salty, you're of no good. Then Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And this is the first thing I want us to see in, in this passage in verse 1 and 2. To hear or not to hear Jesus' teachings. To hear or not to hear Jesus' teaching. As we journey through uh, across this chapter break into chapter 15, having uh, called people to listen in, who would we expect to be surrounding Jesus? We would expect the religious people. The Pharisees and the scribes, those that are into church, those that are faithful to synagogue, right? But, but that's not actually who we see at all. I mean, the Pharisees, the, the, they literally, well, actually, they don't literally, they, metaf I guess, metaphorically speaking, they have fingers in their ears, right? Put your fingers in your ears for just a moment. Put your fingers in your ears. I know some of you won't participate. You're too cool for it. I know. When you put your fingers in your ears, not only do you look absolutely ridiculous, it's really hard to hear, right? Okay, you can take your fingers out. So this is what the Pharisees were doing. They were kind of listening, but not really wanting to listen, right? They just wanted to hear enough so they could mock Jesus, so they could misconstrue and, and twist his words. That's, that's what's happening uh, here in this text. Instead, Jesus, he's surrounded by these undesirables. It's the undesirables in society that want to hear what he has to say. And notice the listening posture of these tax collectors and sinners. They're not halfway engaged. They're all in. You know, they're, rally, they're, they're rallying around Jesus. They want to hear everything that he has to say. You know, they're not uh, leaning against the back wall, scrolling through their cell phone, kind of disengaged. That's not, that's not their posture at all. They want to know every single word that proceeds out of the mouth of Jesus. And in contrast, off in the distance, we have the religious leaders. And, and again, they, hear, well, they want to hear just enough in order to scoff at him. You know, according to Jesus, the Pharisees were like whitewashed tombs. Anybody ever referred to you as a whitewashed tomb? I hope not. It's not a compliment. Okay? Now, in one sense, on the outside, you look beautiful. You're holy. You're pious. You know, your, your faithfulness to synagogue is, is unmeasurable. It is, it's amazing. But on the inside, you're, you're, you're spiritually dead. It's, it's like spiritual dry bones in a tomb. And that's how Jesus saw the Pharisees and the scribes. They were spiritually dry. Then take note of this allegation against Jesus that we read. It says, this man, what does he do? He receives sinners and he eats with them. Just notice the insanity of that statement. You would think that, that if you had leaders in a church that were struggling to reach a certain demographic, but you had people that were coming and, and, and using strategies and approaches that were reaching those people with the gospel, you'd think you'd be excited. You'd think you'd be praising that approach. But instead, they mock him. They, they don't understand because from a spiritual health standpoint, the Pharisees are incredibly sick. They're incredibly sick. They, they, they have kicked the bucket. They are pushing up daisies. Uh, they, they, they're dead on the inside. They are lifeless. And because and, what we see Jesus doing is what it looks like to actually live out the gospel. Because they have built up so many man-made walls that nobody can cross over them, can climb over them in order to get to the heart of God and to, the, to understand what the Bible has to say for them. You guys ever know anybody that's thick-headed? Please don't tap your spouse right now. We're all watching, all right? You guys ever know anybody that's thick-headed? Don't look around. But I looked up the definition of thick-headedness this week, okay? To be thick-headed, the definition was uh, stupid people, uh, dull-witted, uh, blockhead, which I had to look up the definition of what a blockhead was, but none of these are compliments, right? But the Pharisees, they were so thick-headed, they never would get it, what Jesus was teaching them. If we were to uh, rewind and go back to Luke chapter 5, it's in Luke chapter 5 and verse 27 through 32, we read about Jesus' encounter with a tax collector by the name of Levi, also known as Matthew. And in that text, Jesus tells them, this is why I hang out with tax collectors and sinners. Let me read those verses to you. Verse 27 of chapter 5. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. 
And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay, that seems logical, right? We get that. We can read that. We understand that. Got it. They don't got it. Spoiler alert, they never get it. We, they don't get it here in chapter 15. And if we were to jump forward to Luke chapter 19, we have Jesus' encounter with another tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. Let me read for you what we read in that passage. Luke 19, picking up in verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I have come to stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to eat with a guest of a man who is a sinner. So what we see here is, is the Pharisees that continue to mock and make fun of. And that's what the world does. When the world is encountered with the truth of the gospel, it looks at you and it mocks you. It makes fun of you. But you know what you should do? You should do what Jesus did. He took it as a compliment. If they'd had bumper stickers back there, he would have slapped one on the back of his donkey because he was a friend of sinners. And we're called to be that exact same thing. But here's the distinction we made. Jesus did not come to affirm them in their sin. He didn't go and have dinner with a tax collector to let them know it's okay, keep living the way you want to live. He came with them to, to, so he could bring them a message of salvation. He came to, to bring a message of transformation. And guys, even today in the world today, people are still in those same two groups. Those that want to stand far away from Jesus, not truly hear what he has to say, mock him, twist his words, and those that want to gather around closely and listen. As we turn our attention to verses 3 and 4, I want us to see that the shepherd is a relentless pursuer. Looking back at our passage, we encounter uh, sinners that are gathered near. Uh, we, we see Pharisees and, and religious leaders that are grumbling in, in the distance. And Jesus, he, he shares this parable of a lost sheep. It's a simple parable. Even a child could understand it. The children's ministry today, uh, they're, they're being taught uh, the parable of the lost sheep. But why the parable is simple, it does contain some deep truths. Deep truths that, that, that we need to hear today. Verse 3, he said, he, so he told them of this parable. Verse 4, what, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he had lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? You know, Jesus' story, it fits this agrarian setting of Palestine, doesn't it? It's a relatable story. There may have been those around Jesus who are like, yeah, that's happened to me before. I know what it's like to lose a sheep. It's very stressful. So it's a relatable story. And the shepherd, he's sitting here and he's counting the sheep. And oh my goodness, one is wrong. One is missing. I want to know how many times did he count before he, he figured out it was actually one that was missing. But he counts it. And let me just tell you, a sheep is not a smart animal. It does not find its way back. You have to go and seek after the sheep. And I mean, I'll tell you what, shepherds were of modest means. They didn't have a lot of money. Now, whether the, 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 the shepherd owned the sheep himself or not, this is a very stressful situation. This is a very stressful situation. In fact, his job may very well be on the line. And, and, and I'm guessing uh, that if, you know, that he probably cares about these sheep. I, I've never spent a lot of time with sheep. Maybe some of you have. I can only imagine if you're in a field with sheep all day long, you might start talking to sheep. They might become like a pet to you. So there may be some even emotional connection with these sheep. And it, it's important to know that, you know, when a, a sheep is lost, Oh my goodness, what are you getting yourself into? You've got to, you've got to scour the countryside. It may be at, at night. Uh, the, the search is a demanding uh, search. You never know when it's going to end. But it requires great devotion and, and, and great effort to see the task through. And the shepherd will never stop searching for that lost sheep because lost sheep are not a lost cause. If you've ever lost anything of great value, you know that everything stops until you find what you're looking for. And as we read verse four, the text I think solicits a couple questions. Number one, he just leaves the 99. He's lost one. If you leave the 99, he might lose the 99, right? Have you ever thought about that? Are you, are you concerned with that at all? But the point that the, the author's trying to make is that he cares so much for this one lost sheep, he's willing to leave the 99 to find that sheep. And I think the other thing that we see in this task, or in this, in, in this scripture, is that this is an emo emotional event. This will play itself out more. But this is an intense situation to lose a sheep that is precious to you. 
Can you think of a time when you lost something that was really precious to you? Can you remember, can you remember those emotions that were stirring up in your heart? Many years ago, I think Will was about two years old at the time, we were on vacation in, in Florida. And I think we were getting ready to, to go out to dinner. We were staying in a rental house. And, you know, we're looking for the kids and we can't find Will. Okay, parents, you've all been there before. You can't find your kid. One minute in, two minute in. Okay, it's getting a little annoying. All right, where are you, Will? Where are you, Will? You, you start yelling a little louder. Uh, at some point, you start to kind of freak out. And I can remember uh, I was upstairs in a, one of the bedrooms looking and I looked out the window and, and John and Bill are, are, uh, are running up and down the streets. I can't remember what Paul was doing. I'm sure he was doing a similar thing as well, but we couldn't find Will. And at some point you're like, I got to call 911. I've never called 911 in my life. I get on the phone and I don't know if you've ever made a 911 call when you're kind of panicking. It is not the easiest thing to articulate everything that's happened, right? And so I'm on the phone. I'm trying to tell the operator there what's happening. And, you know, I'm trying to walk through all the steps. And eventually I get on the ground in one of the bedrooms and I just start looking. And behind the headboard, I see two little feet. And, you know, obviously I'm relieved. I'm relieved because I found him and, and, and I get Will and I'm like, first of all, why did you not respond, right? And you, so you kind of want to uh, knock him on the head, but at the same time, you're so excited, you just, you just hug them. And so if you've ever been in a position where you've lost something valuable, you know the urgency that's involved. There should be urgency involved when, when we seek lost sheep. I want us to see in verse five through seven, the shepherd, his community in heaven rejoices. The shepherd, his community, and heaven rejoices. Verse 5, and when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulders rejoicing. Now, this is a visual we've all seen before, right? A, a shepherd carrying a sheep around his shoulders. The legs are crossed. Uh, maybe uh, some of you who, who like to decorate early for Christmas, uh, maybe in the coming weeks, uh, you're going to get those nativity sets out. Maybe that's, a, that's kind of a staple piece, right, to have a shepherd with a lamb on the shoulders. We've seen this before. And when something precious is lost, is found, what, we see this immediate relief. There's a reward that's, that's felt with it. You, some of you are habitual misplacers in this room. I, I don't know why in the world you lose your TV remote every day, but you do. Uh, you lose your keys, all these types of things. You know that feeling of, man, I've lost something, but I found it. And the relief that comes with that. And it's marked with rejoicing. And that's what we see here with the shepherd. He's rejoicing. And if you thought losing a sheep wasn't a big deal, read verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice for, with me, for I have found my sheep that I lost. When was the last time you, you found something and you texted your friends and family and said, I found it? That's a pretty big deal if you're doing that. You, maybe some of you have never done that. So this just speaks to how important this was. And it illustrates the significance it was for a shepherd in a community to find a lost sheep. It's amazing. Like everybody's personally involved in this. And that's what we see happening here. And then in verse 7, Jesus brings the thunder down on the Pharisees. He says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Notice the contrast. Here, the Pharisees, they're, they're souring in the corner while the angels are singing in heaven. And when sinners get saved, that's what always happens. Now, Jesus doesn't explicitly tell us who the 99 righteous ones are. Most interpret this to mean uh, he's pointing back at the religious leaders who think that they're righteous. Uh, this interpretation is, is um, I guess, enhanced um, when you start to look at the parable of the prodigal sons, when you think of the older brother, the, the, the one who is self-righteous. So it makes sense that he's talking about the religious leaders. But here's the deal. Let's not get bogged down in trying to figure out who the 99 is. The point of this parable is, is, is the shepherd's love for the lost one. That is the point of this parable. So what does this even mean? What, is this, what, what does this matter to you today? Does it? Well, here's what I would say to you. Number one is this, is that we have to continually search our heart for just pharisaical attitudes that we might have. You know, we want our heart in alignment with God's heart when it comes to missions and evangelism and lost people. We want our heart in alignment. But, but we have to be on guard against pharisaical attitudes toward lostness. And, you know, we're just too darn clever, right? We don't stand off, way off from, from Jesus when he speaks. You know, we would be the ones that would be up close, all right? We would like to at least think that. Being a Pharisee is, 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 is tricky because you never see yourself as a, as a Pharisee. 
And so I started to think through, what are some of the, if I have certain dispositions, uh, or what would cause me to be susceptible to, to being pharisaical towards lost people? And I started to think about even in my own heart, when I'm not being sensitive to lostness or evangelism, what are some things happening in my heart? Well, here's what I would say to you, that these might be some signs that that you may be susceptible to being pharisaical towards the lost. That you have a a, a critical spirit and that you're sometimes with some people, you're kind of known more for what you're against than what you're for. If that's the case, you may not have the heart of God for the lost. You know, if you just kind of avoid building relationships with people that are different from you, if you just like convenient relationships only, well, you may not have the the heart of God for the lost. You know, if repentance and confession isn't a a normal practice to you, whether it's to God or, or even confessing to other brothers or sisters in Christ, well, you may not have a heart of God for the lost. You know, if, if you're a person that kind of steers clear of, of messy ministry, it doesn't quite fit into your calendar, your schedule, and that's how you are today, it's how you were yesterday and how you'll be tomorrow, well, you may not have the heart of God for the lost. If you feel, always feel like you're uniquely exempt from being involved in particular kinds of, of ministry, well, you may not have a, a heart the heart of God for the lost. And we could go on and on, but I'd also say like just in your daily planning and as you map out what's coming down the pike, if ministry, if ministry to the lost, to to neighbors, whether it's a mission trip, whatever it may be, if it's never on your radar, then you may not have the heart of God for the lost. These are the times that, these are the things that, that I have to guard against. You know, two words that we see associated with evangelism in the Bible are people who are evangelistic is hospitable and generous. I want to be a hospitable person. I want to be a generous person. And the more of those things I am, the more compassion I'll probably have toward the lost. Again, the tricky thing is Pharisees never see themselves as Pharisaical. But here's what the Pharisee mindset does. It looks at a lost person and it says to you and it says to them, you can come. You can come. Just get yourself cleaned up and you can come. And you can be a part of what we're doing. But that's not the approach of Jesus. Jesus looked at the lost person and he didn't tell them to come. He went to them. Because if Jesus had adopted the approach of the Pharisees, that here's our high walls, as long as you can climb over them, you can enter. You know what? Matthew would still be sitting at the tax booth. He would have been unbelievably rich, but spiritually impoverished. And if Jesus had had that same approach with with the woman at the well, the woman at the well would still be at the well having no one having spoken to her yet. And if Jesus had adopted that approach, Zacchaeus would still be in that darn tree. But Jesus didn't have that approach. He loved people. He didn't seek to punish the sheep. He said, sheep, I will come to you. Not only will I come to you, he says, I will care for you. This is the type of Jesus that we have. And the application here for us is that we need to have a passion for the lost. But also I want us to see that believer, that that we should believe the lost are never a lost cause. We must believe that, guys. It's important that that we understand that that God is still at work. He's still doing great things. You know, one of the things that we, uh, slogans we say in the office when we're working with the missions team is missions is more fun. And it is fun. We really enjoy it. But missions is also really hard. It comes with great sacrifice. Those of you that went on a mission trip this last year, that's a sacrifice. You got to use vacation time. It's money. You, you, you got to put yourself in, a, in an uncomfortable situation. Whatever kind of ministry you're related in, there, there's obviously a sacrifice. But, you know, there's also, it, it's, it can be very challenging from a, a church ministry standpoint. You know, we've had 20 wonderful years of missions ministry, but it, it hasn't always been fun every single day. You know, we've had, we've had uh, issues with leadership, with, with ministries uh, that, have, that have been very challenging for our missions team. We've had to work through some hard things. We've had to cancel six, seven, eight trips over the years. You know, it's not a lot of fun to call a missionary and say we couldn't get anybody to sign up to come see you. That's a hard thing to do. But, but, it doesn't, but, but, but we have to continue to push forward. And, and even though these things happen, we know that the calling is great. But like Jesus, we must be relentless pursuers of the lost, both as individuals and a church. And we need to believe God is at work. Man, when, we, when our eyes are covered and we look at the world and all we see is spiritual um, 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 drought, uh, then, then we're not going to share the gospel. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 9, my goodness, the harvest is full. We just need more people to work the fields. And and we need to trust God is moving. We do not want to underestimate what God might do. He loves to use faithful servants. Let us be faithful servants. 
You know, Barna is a research group. Recently, they came out with a study that said 23% of evangelical Christians in their lifetime will go on a mission trip. 23%. You know, I was 22 years old before I went on a mission trip. I had no idea the blessing that comes from going on a mission trip and, and how it, it enriches your life. It gives you a, a, a greater understanding of the kingdom of God, how God is working all over the world. But God is working. In 2016, we took our very first mission trip to Ethiopia with five loaves. When we got there, I was speaking to Jonas, who oversees the Hope Center there. I said, Jonas, what percentage of Ethiopians um, are evangelical, Bible-believing Christians? He said about 10%. This past year, we were there. I felt like the church was more vibrant. And, and I asked him, like today, like how, what percentage of people here today are evangelical, Bible-believing Christians? He says, it's gone from 10 to 20% in just the years that you've been coming. It's incredible. God is working. He is moving. The fields are ripe for harvest. They are never a lost cause. The last thing I want to say to you is let's rejoice over God's, uh, God's expanding kingdom. You know, when the lost sheep was found, the shepherd, he celebrates. Guys, we should celebrate as a community of believers when God is, is moving and working. We should all be keenly aware of how amazing it is to be saved by the gospel. And when we see that happening in people's lives, whether it's in our, in our own city or whether we go on mission trips and, and we help advance the gospel through ministries overseas, we should be excited about that. We should rejoice. Today is a day of celebration of what God is doing. So we come, we celebrate, we celebrate what God has done, what he's doing and what he's going to continue to do. But here's the deal. We need you. Missions doesn't happen without you. None of us are exempt. And, and the reality is, you know, we've had a lot of wonderful people at our church, older people, senior adults who have gone to be with the Lord in recent years. And some of them were great champions of missions. But we need young people like some of you to step up and say, for the first time, I'm going to be involved in missions. So we need more people. You know, I'm going to end with this. In, um, earlier I mentioned that we'd gone on basically 140 trips. I think it's 143 trips over the last 20 years. It's a great number. It's fantastic. And I remember those early years of going on trips um, we had a lot of uh, young single people going. And you know, young single people are great, but you know what young, uh, young sing, uh, single people don't have? Money. And so we had this onslaught of support letters that would go out all the time. And people would say, hey, can we send these out? And we'd be like, yes, you can send them to your BFG and, and people that you're friends with in the church, okay? Sounds like a great strategy, right? Unless you're friends with everybody in the church and you're one of those individuals that always gets the support letters. And uh, we had a, a couple people in particular, I remember, that seemed to always be giving money to mission trips. And uh, one of those families that always seemed to be donating a little here, a little there to everybody uh, was Urban Martha Searles. And I remember having a conversation with Miss Martha at one point, and I don't know, Miss Martha, if you remember this, but you, we were speaking, and, um, and I had seen that you had given to quite a few people that year, and I'd come to you, and I said, how many support letters have you received this year? And you told me, and I was flabbergasted. And I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know we had that many people going on mission trips. And I felt kind of bad for the Searles. Um, and I, they want to give, they want to be generous, but obviously it's challenging where you're getting a lot of letters in the mail all the time. And Miss Martha says, you know, maybe you should come up with like a mission trip scholarship fund. That would be a great idea. We can kind of distribute the wealth uh, a, a little bit. And you know, that was the very first time, you know, we started the Great Commission offering in 2010. We included in their mission trip scholarship funds. But it was that conversation conversation I had with Martha that first made me think that we should do something like that. But you know, Mr. Herb passed away. We had his funeral here yesterday. 82 years he was a member here. 82 years. Praise Jesus. You know how many people they helped send on mission trips? I don't even know. But we need people to replace people like Mr. Herb. We need the church to continue to grow and to bring new people in. And I leave you with this. Mr. Herb is still sending people on mission trips. I read, you, I read you the last line from his obituary from yesterday that was read. In lieu of flowers, memorial donations may be made to the Ninth and O Baptist Church Great Commission Offering. Martha, thank you for your example. We love you. We need more Herb and Marthas. Are you going to be an Herb and Martha? Are you ready to go? You don't have any money, but you can go. We can help you with that. You, you can't go for one reason or another, but you got some money. We can help you with that too. We can all be engaged one way or another because to reach the loss, it's not a lost cause. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's a blessing to be a part of a church where so many people love you and care about you that are passionate for missions. I know there's, there are um, churches across this nation that they would love to go on just one mission trip. 
Uh, but Lord, you have just, uh, you've given so much kindness to us and all the people that you've sent. Lord, may we never uh, lose that sense of urgency to continue to reach out. Lord, we're thankful for the good work that you're doing here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.